We're here to understand why Texas, how we are connected um, to each other. We just saw that we're all from different regions and why um, Texas is a place to be. So I'm just gonna give you a, a quick snippet on um, how Army Futures Command got here since, since um, I was part of the first wave. Some of us were part of the first wave. And this is kind of a, a foundation of why this is so important. So, you know, Army Futures Plan 2018, August-ish, uh, August 24th to be exact, moved, uh, they, they started a four-star command uh, in Austin. Out of 364 cities and towns it could have went to, it went to Austin. More importantly, it came to Texas. And a lot of that was because of the ecosystem that uh, Texas provides in terms of capital, in terms of the culture and people, in terms of the R1 research, and then the culture of innovation. Really, those things, um, and then the patriotism of Texas in this kind of triangle. So you have Austin, San Antonio, Houston College Station, and then and DFW. Um, that was kind of the trifecta, how Texas sold to the Army um, this is why you should be here. So the Army stood up its four-star command, the largest reorganization of the Army since 1974. I know most of you were not born at, during that, that time, so I'll, I'll tell you, you know, OG can tell you what it was like. Uh, <laughs> but it was a $187 billion portfolio to accelerate modernization for Department of Defense, or really for the Army and Department of Defense writ large. If you just think about that for a second, that is a very daunting task because we were focused on Iraq and Afghanistan for so long uh, that there are some technology areas where we were quite, to be quite frank, we were, we were behind them. And the folks that are on this panel really kind of represent uh, how we can accelerate that modernization on behalf of DOD and really on behalf of our war fighters. Right, I, it's, I got skin in the game. I have twins that are gonna graduate here from the Corps um, in a month. Wow. I will go to class with them every day until they graduate, because uh, we're at the final, <laughs> the final uh, crucible. Um, and then they'll commission and one will go, uh, both of them will go in the Army, one infantry, one army. So when we say what these guys do is really important, um, I, I really uh, believe in that wholeheartedly. Because if we have a fight, we want that to be an unfair fight. Because we have young Americans that are uh, behind us. So having said that, uh, I'm going to introduce first is uh, OG. Um, so John O'Grady is from Raytheon. Um, and he's out of Austin. And Margaret Kidd, uh, who's really her focus area is on supply chain. She's uh, at a, a U of H. Uh, we have Mike Dietz. So Mike Dietz is an NDIA uh, national board member, so National Defense uh, Industrial Association. And then Brian Cook, he's an IBMer. He's also out of Austin. And then uh, Chris Dineski, um, who is with BAE out of, out of Austin. Right? They're out of Austin, but they represent these, these great companies that um, are throughout. They're not just Texas Based. They're really kind of globally based. So I'm going to throw out the first question: um, Why Texas or why not Texas? And I'll, uh, well, Brian, can you start us off? So um, the biggest thing about Texas, right, is a place where we are seeing growth in a time where our nation is having a hard time with finding growth for key jobs. Texas led the nation last year in non-farm jobs. February 2023 was two, a mark of two years straight of growth for Texas for non-farm jobs. There's very few states in the nation that can boast that. And so for IBM and companies like IBM, it's important to find that place where you can gain uh, yardage in where you aren't gaining yardage in other states. And Texas represents that for us. Uh, a couple of ways we're doing that, if I have the mic yep. for a couple of seconds. So um, one of the bigger things that we're trying to do is figure out that exact way to have a, a connection with the 
local, regional, and national governments in building skilled workers for our nation. One of the biggest ways we did that is we committed to building uh, workers in the cybersecurity range uh, before 2030. We also um, are, are raising money uh, specifically in the realm of quantum computing. Um, in the last five years, the company has put $100 million towards quantum computing. Those are two ways of doing it. And I'll talk further about that. I don't want to take too much of the mic time. But I'll talk further about kind of the how of those things uh, later on in the conversation. Well, um, you know, I'm from Houston. Um, I'm an instructional associate professor. I run the supply chain program. Maybe you've seen me on BBC or Maria Bartiromo or one of those goofy shows. I don't know. But uh, regardless, um, you know, I'm here because I feel we have this imperative to really connect to the different regions. And what I saw during the last three years of the COVID crisis was Texas made out like a bandit. We won. We won in jobs. We won in corporate relocations. We won in cargo. And that's what counts for the city of Houston um, being the largest port in tonnage and also being a region where between the port of Houston and the port of Freeport, 150 million people can be reached within a thousand miles. So we have a geographical competitive advantage. And with all of this new manufacturing and defense organizations moving in, we need, we need that logistics system. And Houston is well positioned to take care of you guys. In, in, in the, the space that, that we're in, um, trusted capital is important, and I would say uh, a secure supply chain, right? So we talk about supply chain, uh, it's important, uh, but in the work that a lot of us do or that we're focused on, a secure supply chain. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, Mike? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I would say that there are so many defense contractors in, in the DFW area. Right, um, and then you've got what you just talked about in Austin with these small businesses, and so you, in order to really be successful in the defense industry, you've got to have a commercial industry to support. So I think it's critical to have that um, that secure, you know, area in, in the middle of the country where you're going to have a lot more U.S.-based companies, a lot of companies that that basically aren't shipping too many products to our adversaries, or at least not the advanced ones. And so getting that trusted capital and that secure system, um, yeah, I think is, is critical. But I also say further, you know, what you have going on at a &M is, is pretty phenomenal. The Umbrellas campus, um, obviously uh, Houston. I mean, when you start connecting what all these different cities have and how they could, they're each their own different types of economic clusters, but it just turns out that as the world is sort of getting a little bit smaller and the state's getting a little bit smaller, we're all getting more connected. This is the perfect time to start tackling some of the biggest problems that we have. You mentioned modernization, probably the biggest problem we have is modernization. How do, what is the next big advanced thing? I've already talked to three or four people here that have great deals on that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, start a little bit by riffing off of where Brian uh, finished, um, or where he started, I should say. but. Before I do that, we'll probably talk about numbers here a lot. And I want to just kind of give you a little bit of perspective, right? Because we, we lose perspective sometimes when we talk about uh, large numbers, especially. Uh, and and I, I'm not going to do public math necessarily here. But stay with me. Magnitude of difference, okay? A billion seconds is about 12 days, all right? A million seconds is about 32 days. And a trillion seconds is about 32,000 years. Okay, think about that for a second. We like, you know, sometimes we think about it as like one, two, three. Okay, it's clearly not that. All right. Now I'm I'm from New York. Okay, I'm proud to say that. All right. I've been in Texas. For, I've been in Texas for two years. That there should be a sign for each person here uh, off to the side. I apologize. I normally bring them with me. I've been I've been in Texas for two years, and I'm I am currently briefing the Raytheon senior leadership team about how it should view Texas as a country. And if it did so, and it aligned just a very few 
like a rounding error worth of resources behind that idea just to test my premise, we would solve three of our biggest headwinds, okay? And our headwinds, there's, this is public knowledge, I'm not giving you any insider proprietary information, and I'm sure it'll resonate with a lot of you all in this room. It's human capital, right, people, okay, workforce, it's supply chain, and then it's novel technology. All three of those things exist in this state. You have a two trillion dollar GDP, wait, trillion, T, right? Ninth largest in the world, GDP. You should just be able to stop there and go, yep, Texas is a country, okay? <laughs> but for those folks who are slow, I'll give you a couple other little pinpoints, right? <laughs> it um, wasn't this smart at West Point. Yeah, I'll no. tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played the cross, that's why. Right? <laughs> Number one uh, Fortune 500 companies. I think Ed might have mentioned that, but if you didn't, I'm, I'll mention it for you. Number one, right? Governor's Cup, 11th straight year in a row. Okay, give yourself a round of applause. Okay, because everybody in this room had to contribute to that. Okay, um, and, and you can just keep going on and on down the list of why Texas as a whole is unbelievably suited to be a leader, not only in our nation, but globally. And as an outsider coming in, okay, I haven't completely boiled yet in that pot, that frog you drop in the pot, right? I haven't completely boiled yet because I haven't changed sports team affiliation, sorry, okay? <laughs> Uh, I don't know where I'm wrong, uh, but Texas is a country. Um, if, if you all could figure out how to harness the entirety of this state and break down and chip away just a little bit of some of the silos and the barriers that exist between Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, uh, you know, Brazos, Brownsville, right? Um, I mean, I'm telling you. It, you know, you want to talk, so to use the word, uh, opportunity, right? I mean, that, that, that is the big uh, opportunity, and it's there for the taking. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Raytheon's excited to be a part of it. Uh, and the great people uh, in this state, you know, just been so welcoming, not only to me personally, but to Raytheon as well. So really appreciate it and really excited to be a part of it, too. And I would say that... Um you know, BAE really put their money where their mouth is and mm -hmm. expanded uh, their presence in Texas in a large way. I don't, I don't know if you know that they expanded their campus uh, in an area that's not cheap. Uh, so talk about believing in the product, believing in what what they do and where they do it. I think BAE is put the money where their mouth is, Chris. Yeah, well, and, and we're accepting. We all, John's here, we're accepting. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Ross said, kind of follow the money. Where, where are people actually investing? So BAE, we had a facility for years in Austin, uh, the old trade core facility, but we just invested double the size of our, our factory facility in North Austin. Again, not cheap, but it's part of the human capital. We're, we're in a competition for talent. Uh, where are we going to find the engineers? Where are we going to find the product and program managers to help develop and uh, produce the exquisite type systems that we, we built. And, and so you have to come to where the talent is. Uh, the other piece that John mentioned was innovation. And that, that's another place where, where we have invested. We've seen the value in the broader Texas, specifically based out of Austin, but we move, we move around. We have a team called our Fast Labs team and they are our technology scouts. So we have our portfolios. We have a lot of smart folks in our organization, but we understand that we don't have everything. So finding those technologies that are complementary that can embed within the different systems we have. Uh, how do we reach out to those folks? We, we, we have uh, folks full-time at Capital Factory and with Mass Challenge. Uh, they come out here with uh, teas to be able to build those relationships and find those, those entrepreneurs and those companies that have those new great ideas. Because, oh, by the way, server process is great, but it doesn't get you where you need to go. Uh, so really having uh, one of the primes that can, we were talking about the headaches of the overhead working with the government. There are a lot of benefits with working with, with us and we really see the benefits of working with the folks that have the novel ideas that are thinking outside the box because I guarantee you, John, Brian, Ross and I, we all, we've been 
know, we're institutionalized. We think a certain way after 27, some odd, 30 years in the military, we think of problems in one way. So seeing that different perspective and getting engaged with those folks, I think that brings us to value. So, and we have advocates, right? We, we have we have people that are focused on, on helping our industries move forward. And I know Patricia would kill me if we didn't mention, you know, NDIA. Maybe you might to talk a little bit about what NDIA does for the community. Absolutely, thank you for coming. I, you know, and by the way, um, I'll mention Patricia's role here in a second, but NDIA champions issues that are of strategic national importance. So modernization is one of the topics we talked about, supply chain, workforce, whatever those issues are. Small businesses having a hard time doing business with the federal government, that's one of our issues that we care about, right? And then we uh, convene forums on these things. Well, we build the communities, which is part of what Y Texas is helping us do today. We, we connect with organizations like Y Texas, and then we, we build the communities, and then we convene the forums, right? And so we're not always the one convening the forum. Sometimes somebody else is convening the forum. It really doesn't matter who's leading, right? Uh, one of the things I think I, I learned from, you know, I never served in the military. One thing I learned from people serving in the military is you be a good leader or you got to be a good follower, yeah. right? And I think one of the things I, I see is you all lead and follow really well. And so everybody just kind of works together, leads each other to where they need to go, connects each other where they need to go. There is, and I have to say it, there is an NDIA chapter in Texas. It's called the Lone Star Chapter. The president of the Lone Star Chapter is sitting right there in a white jacket. Her name is Patricia Baumhart. Um, she's a, an amazing person. You should get to know her tonight, and that should be on the top of your list. And then you should connect on our newsletter. Um, you go to ndialonestar.org, contact us, and you can get on our newsletter. And, and we will post any event related to that's relevant to the defense industry and we'll help put it out there. I, I sit on the national board now. Um, and so I'm in DC trying to pay attention to those issues, but I can tell you that Texas is on the radar when it comes to solving national security problems because, um, and we had a major conference here, the Joint Weapon and Command and Control in College Station was really amazing. So, so NDIA is, is one of the organizations you want to be connected to to help you get connected to other other groups. For sure. that, that was two years ago. Uh, last year was in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the only reason we did it here last year was uh, our a couple of the days are at the classified level. Our facility that we were using was uh, was being uh, you know, renovated. Uh, so, you know, Texas A&M, you know, we talk about workforce development and, you know, I'm going to Mark could, could follow up. One of the things about Texas A&M, 24,000 engineering students, right? So you're, you're talking about 75,000 students, the largest university uh, in the United States. Um, STEM is a, a national imperative. It's a national security imperative. Uh, you know, I was talking about uh, Ruth, Ruth Hughes, uh, chairs a, a, a board for the Texas Science and Engineering Fair. We just had it here at Texas A&M, and it was fantastic. It gives you hope. It gives you a, a good feeling that our future is bright when you see 1,100 kids or young leaders getting after some really, really tough projects. Uh, and you know that if they, you, they were set on the right path, uh, that they can really make change in, in our world for, for good, right? I, I sit on that, she asked, she called me up one day, she said, hey, say yes. I said, yes, and she said, okay, you're on the board. You know, board or what? And then I got nothing for like a month. And then I was invited to all these meetings and I found out what that was about. But it is a nonprofit board that really helps young people um, get after their dreams. And their dreams are tied to our future, right? And you should, you should be very proud of those young kids. So, um, you know, can I just add to that real quick? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, you know, the other thing that really strikes me about um, this community in particular, um, but Texas uh, writ large, is um, an inherent sense of an obligation and a duty to service. And I think you all have figured it out better than just about anybody else. You know, because in the military, you get the, you know, you, you move every two to three years. You're in all sorts of different places and locations, and you get to interact with all sorts of different people, right? So you, you you have a perspective of just some of the differences that make us all unique. 
Um, and I always found it a little odd, you know, where in the rest of the country, it seems like to me, or largely speaking, the rest of the country, there's this notion that, you know, service somehow equates to being in a uniform, right? We, we talk about the 1%, right? So just think about that narrative and what that puts into the minds of our young people. Okay, so what I'm doing isn't service, isn't as important somehow? No, I mean, it's a false narrative, right? You all are serving. No, no, no less importantly than any of us who have worn the cloth of our nation, right? You all are serving by making your communities better, by making your communities stronger, by providing education for folks, the young folks who are coming behind us. Um, and so I would just tell you, don't ever lose that as you all evolve and, and, and this state, you know, maybe uh, gets a little more alignment coherence that I was talking about earlier and really starts to blow this whole thing up. Um, don't lose sight of that because that is incredibly important and it is an unbelievable discriminator that you all have. And I don't know if you really appreciate it as much as you should. And so I'm just going to say thank you for your service right now as somebody who has served. And, you know, go home and when you're in your communities, thank the teacher, right? Thank the small business owner. Thank the startup person. Thank the person working at healthcare. You know, thank those folks for their service because it's unbelievably important. Mayor just left, actually. He's going to be pissed. So, we got a write in vote tomorrow, folks. Right. <laughs> so, Margaret is uh, just. We're gonna just, a, we only have a couple minutes left, but Margaret, not only, she hasn't lived all her life in, in academia, right? She came from Wall Street. She talked a little bit about that and some of the dynamics of what we're doing and how that relates to our, our economy and GDP. Well, I think this kind of relates to the last two topics, the STEM and service. So, you know, when you had a career in the corporate world and you hit middle age and you wanna do something meaningful, you have a number of choices. Um, I didn't choose academia, it found me and I love it. Um, but you know, I'll tell you as an educator, one of the things we do to drive services, you know, sometimes some of the projects we do are hands-on learning experiences related to service. And I'm really proud to say that we have a student board that actually goes to one of the food banks and, and volunteers their time. And I mean, it's just, I love seeing that because that's just part of being part of a community, regardless what you're majoring in or what your occupation is, is just kind of engaging. But back to the STEM conversation, which I really think is important. Um, my, I'm proud to say my program is one of three STEM supply chain undergraduate degrees in the state of Texas. The other two are up north and some town called Dallas and Fort Worth. Um, <laughs> um, but I, you know, mine's in Houston. Uh, the nation's fourth largest city. And, um, <laughs> I need I need I students. But I mean, at the end of the day, and you know, I'm quoted as saying this pretty frequently those people that did well during this crisis the last three years were collaborating. You look at Amazon, um, okay, yeah, they went and chartered their own ships and planes, but you know what they did? They then, you know, reached out to their competitors and said, we have extra space, put your cargo on our plane. I mean, that's what friends do in the battle zone, okay? Um, and so we have to do more of that on the economic development side. We've got to collaborate. And I think there's great lessons learned looking at like um, social network analysis. And I'm not talking social media, just social network analysis, which is kind of graph theory, and looking at where we have these clusters and these centers of influence and how we weave to create a stronger um, economic vitality where, and it's not just the defense industry. I mean, Texas is rich. We have the healthcare, we have energy transition, we have agriculture, but there's an opportunity to be very purposeful right now. Yeah. So we're going to do, I'm going to, one takeaway, I didn't tell them what we were going to do because I said it's just going to be really easy. So uh, one takeaway uh, that you want the, the folks to have, uh, and we're going to start with Chris and then we'll, I'll, I'll close it out. 
by thinking the our gracious host. I think the, the one takeaway I have is, is again, it's the, we kind of get at the, the collegial, the cooperative uh, environment we have here in Texas. You see it where people are sharing information, sharing ideas, because you don't know where those, you know, those collision of ideas turns into something serendipitous that really helps take both parties in, in the right direction. So having the forums to be able to talk about things that are of importance and sharing those ideas, whether they're, they're complementary or, or in conflict, uh, lead to the, the breaks or the, or the generational jumps. So continuing on with that you know, and, and uh, keeping that going forward. So I think events like this, events like we have across uh, Texas, I think is something we need to maintain. Um, to a quote from the Army War College, uh, physics doesn't move mountains, chemistry does. And if you don't believe that, try to be in a room with people you don't like and find a common agenda to solve something that's really wild and new. I happen to do two elections in two really wild places, Iraq and Afghanistan. And in each case, uh, it took the act of kind people to find a common agenda to go forward quickly. You can push and resist against things all day long, but if you find two or three or 10 people to go with you, you will go stronger and faster than you ever could imagine. I would say we are at a convergence of a lot of opportunity, and, and specifically what I'll say is many great things do actually, from going from the ARPANET to many other uh, inventions come out of the federal government. And so the federal government is very serious about modernization, keeping pace with China. They're very serious about infrastructure, which, by the way, these things are very connected. If you haven't met Jeff Deco from Autonomy Institute sitting there in the back, um, you know, the connection of, of all these things coming together and all the things that each of these different cities, by the way, don't forget about El Paso, we can get some representation from there, <laughs> and how, the, how all these cities can work together now better than ever. It, it, this is the best time. So whatever industry you're in, now's the time to go. And, and, and if you're struggling with federal contracting or whatever it is, somebody in NDIA or somebody in one of these organizations can help you. So if, if you don't know, if you don't meet the person in this room who can help you, chances are the person in this room knows the person who can help you. Absolutely. Well, I, when I'm thinking about this conversation, I'm really thinking about a quote from Charles Villavicencio was around during um, post-apartheid in South Africa um, and on thoughts on how you change a nation's center, you change the middle. And the way we change the middle is by having conversations and telling stories and breaking bread like we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, again, I'll just go back to your, your greatest strength, and it's your people. And it's the sense of service that exists inside this uh, state um, you know, I just got done watching uh, the two prequels to Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> the, this notion of this nation and this state and this country being um, really where it is today because of the sense of an idea of something better. There's always the idea, the striving of something better while still being able to appreciate what you have today that's really unique, right? Because you can you can strive for something better and just be a cynic all day long about what today is and what tomorrow's going to bring, um, and that really doesn't ever get you anywhere. And so don't again don't lose that that's within the DNA fabric of of this great state is what I would tell you, and that's coming from New York. That was great. Um, I want to just say thank you for for the folks that attended. Um, I want to thank uh, our host here at the hotel. I, I see Sheila Sandoval there. Uh, she's a general manager who's been fantastic. She's she's like the first lady of Stella for sure, um, and my boss when I'm here. Uh, and then Spencer Clements, one, one of the proprietors here. Thank thank you for allowing us to to share you know what these um, these great leaders have to say. And then for White Texas and what White Texas does to try to stitch all these different communities together in order to make uh, you know, the, the great state of Texas is currently. Yeah, that's right. And, and also our sponsor, thanks. Uh, 
Um, and then I'd just like to say on behalf of you know Texas A and M, you can't sp spell America without A and M. So, <laughs> so guys, I think the drinks are on. Uh,